Good morning. Our text this morning begins in James chapter 2, verse 14. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, You have faith, and I have works. Well, show me your faith apart from your works. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. Faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, God, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for this word that you have preserved from your servant James. We pray, Father, that you help us to be active in our faith. Help us, Father, uh, not to, uh, to relax on the beliefs that we have in you, but to recognize, Father, that our very faith in you demands change in our lives, uh, demands active service in this world. We pray, Father, that you help us to remain true to your ways. And Father, we thank you so much for the gifts that you've given us in your Son, that through him we have received the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. And Father, we know that he is at this very moment alive at your right hand, and that you will send him again to judge the living and the dead. We pray, Father, that you hasten that day and that you grant us endurance until that day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so there's, there's a stereotype, I guess, about the churches of Christ that we just alternate Sundays between preaching this passage and Acts 2.38. And if you're visiting with us this morning, I promise you that's not what's going on. <laughs> um, we are continuing a study of the book of James. And you know, there's, there's a reason why, um, in our circles, we return to this passage so often. James has been instructing us in how to live as Christians out in the world. As he addresses us in the first verse, he calls us the, the dispersion, or the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Uh, that is, we are like Israel back during the days of the exile and afterwards when they were dispersed over the face of the earth and had to learn how to live faithfully among the Gentiles. We are strangers out in the world, and have to learn to live as Christians in an unbelieving world. And James has repeatedly challenged us in that context to question what good our religion is. Right? If we say that we're out in the world living as Christians, if that's our religion, James is constantly challenging us, what good is your religion? Right, near the beginning of the letter, he writes in chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But he must uh, let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So James asks us, wait, what good is our asking things of God, particularly the wisdom to handle trials and temptations, what good is our asking if we don't believe that God will grant us the wisdom that we need to live righteously? He also says, 
Chapter 1, verse 22, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And of course, James is expanding on that idea in our reading this morning. This idea that, uh, what, what good does it do for you to hear the word? Right? We get together every Sunday, and you know, but anymore we get together twice on Sundays and once in the middle of the week, and we're in the word together, we're proclaiming the word, and James challenges us. What good does your hearing do if you're not actually doing the things that you hear? And yet again, he says in chapter 1, verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And we asked last week at the beginning of chapter 2, what good is a person's religion if he goes out and provides for the needy during the week, like James talks about at the end of chapter 1, but then turns around and discriminates against the needy in the worship assembly, like he talks about at the beginning of chapter 2? So just over and over again, James is challenging us, what good is your religion? And he's showing us places where if we're not careful, we can slip into what we might call religiosity, where, where we have the trappings of religion, but we lack the true substance of religion. And he's showing us point after point what is of substance, what makes true religion. In fact, he's even he's phrased things in those terms. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. You want to know what true religion is? He lays it out for us. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. But James wants us to have substance in our religion, not just the trappings of religion. James has mentioned a host of other failings up to this point in the letter. Pursuing wealth, giving in to sin, blaming God for temptations, being quick to speak and being quick to anger, uh, filthy, what he calls filthiness and rampant wickedness. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways that we can, we can do this wrong. This morning's reading focuses on that idea, and he begins with... The question, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? It's another question of what good is your religion? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? Now, when James asks, what good is that? That question cuts two ways. Right? Obviously, what, what good does it do to a poor person if all you have to offer are kind words? But as we have seen, James is also interested in the other question, what good is it to you what good is it to me if I say that I visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction, but then don't actually do anything? Right? Like, how do we mean visit? Am I just showing up to stare at them? What good is my religion if I'm only paying it lip service? Right? What good does it do to us to say that Jesus is our master, to wear that name Christian if we don't do what he says. Lip service is no good. Lip service doesn't feed anybody. Go in peace, be warmed and filled. And it doesn't save anybody either. Our faith must include works. And that's because faith and works are inseparable. 
If someone wants to try to separate faith from works, then James offers this challenge. Show me your faith apart from your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Right? You can't show your faith apart from works, is what James says. The only way that you can demonstrate faith is through living it out, doing it. And there's a reason for that. James says at the end of the chapter this morning, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. He's, he's working an analogy here. He says that faith is like the body, and works are like the spirit that animates that body. Now that might be the reverse of how we're used to thinking about things. Uh, we, we might think of things the other way around, that good works form the body of our religion, and that faith is what keeps the whole thing moving, that faith is the animating force behind it all. James does something that, that I think to a lot of people today is provocative. He gives us the opposite image, that faith is the body of our religion, and good works keep the whole thing moving. The good works are the animating force that keeps the body alive. All right, I want to illustrate that, or I guess explain that a little further, with something else that James says. He asks us, oh, you believe that God is one? All right. Good job. Even the demons believe and tremble. Now, notice that James doesn't just say, you believe in God? or you believe that God exists, he says, you believe that God is one. James is invoking a passage from the law to the beginning of what we call the Shema, what Jesus calls the greatest command. I'll read it from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. James is not just talking about some nebulous kind of faith. He is talking about actual correct faith. He's talking about correct theology. Do you believe that God is one? But look at what James says about that. James says even the demons have correct theology. The demons understand not only that God exists, they understand who God is. They're not confused on this point. But obviously the demons don't have anything like true religion. And it's because they lack the rest of the commandment. They don't, they don't love God. They're certainly not doing the works of God. In that way, faith is like the body of our religion. We are, we are Christians because we confess Christ. We confess that God is one and that Jesus of Nazareth is his son. That is the body of our religion. Definitionally, that's what makes us Christian. But what good does that do us if we're not doing anything about it? What good does it do us if we are not obedient? James, James just tells us the answer outright all through this morning's reading. Our religion, if that is what it is, is worthless. So we'll close with two examples that James gives us in this reading. <clears throat> James teaches that Abraham's faith is proven in his obedience. And the example he gives is the sacrifice of Isaac. Now remember what the angel of the Lord tells Abraham when he raises the knife, whenever the angel stops Abraham's hand. 
The angel says to him in Genesis 12, or sorry, 22, 12, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham's faith is evident in his works. And thus, James says, the scripture is fulfilled. This says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Uh, what do we suppose would have happened if Abraham had withheld Isaac? If he gets up on the mountain, well, we, we could really paint this any number of ways. right? Because if Abraham is not raising his knife against Isaac to offer him up, well, then it's just a matter of deciding arbitrarily at what point earlier we're going to draw the line. Right? Abraham obeys insofar as going up on the mountain, but then just sits there serenely on the top of the mountain because he knows that God is not going to take his only begotten son from him. Would that be counted to Abraham as faith? Or what if Abraham just knew from the beginning that God is not going to require his son from him. And oh, I have faith in God. So whenever God tells him to go to the mountain, he doesn't even bother to go to the mountain because he has faith. Would that be counted to him as righteousness? Uh, there's, there's a lot that we could say about that. Too much, unfortunately. We will suffice with what the Hebrew writer says on the subject. Uh, this, I think, explains how Abraham's faith is seen in his active obedience. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Or you consider what a difficult position that puts Abraham in, by the way. What an impossible position that puts Abraham in. This is, by the way, the, the, the astounding nature of Abraham's faith and the way that we see him acting it out. Because God has said to Abraham, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And yet God has also said to Abraham that he is to offer Isaac up. Those, those two things, God has said both of those things to Abraham. If Abraham has faith, he knows that those, both of those things must be true. And yet I hope we can see how those things seem to be at odds with each other. Isaac must live. But also Isaac must die. But also Isaac must live. Here's Abraham's faith. He considered, the Hebrew writer says, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham is one of the first people that we have recorded in the scriptures who believes in the resurrection. Would Abraham's belief, would his faith in the resurrection have meant anything if he were unwilling to obey the command of God? Now, someone might object, well, Abraham's an exceptional case. Well, sure, he's an exceptional case. <clears throat> I suppose maybe that's why James also brings up the example of Rahab, who is not an exceptional case. No one calls Rahab the mother of faith, like Abraham is called the father of faith. Paul calls Abraham that. Rahab is not the mother of the nation of Israel, like Abraham is the father of the nation of Israel. And the scriptures call him that all the time. They even call Sarah the mother of Israel. Isaiah does. In fact, Rahab is not even an Israelite. In other words, her identity is not what saves her. It's not because she's some special case. James says that what saves her, what justifies her, is her works. She received the messengers, 
and sent them out by another way. That's what saves her. And so as James has asked us so often, we must ask ourselves, what good is my religion? Am I just wearing a name? Or am I actually living according to that name? In this letter, we have seen many examples of people who confess that God is one. James says their religion is worthless. We've seen examples of people who hear the word proclaimed. If they're not doers of the word, their religion is worthless. We've seen examples of people who assemble for worship. If they show partiality, their religion is worthless. We've seen examples of people who pray to God and ask him for wisdom. James says if they don't ask in faith, their religion is worthless. These challenges should ever be in front of us. Does my religion mean anything? And so let us be admonished by James to have a living and active faith that trusts in God and trusts him enough to obey him consistently. That is the call that we offer to everyone assembled this morning. To obey the word and the will of God because his word carries promises. Just like we saw with Abraham. Abraham hears the word of God, and he understands in that word a promise. So, well, if God's going to take my son from me, he's going to bring him back from the dead. The promise is for you and for me and for everyone, both near and far. Uh, Since we started by talking about Church of Christ stereotypes. Let's finish by talking about Church of Christ stereotypes. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And so we invite you to obey that call, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, turn away from sin, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation, won't you come forward and obey as together we stand and sing.